Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Sport Flex podcast and I'm happily joined by Bristol Flies captain Daniel Adozi. What is good bro? Brian man how you doing? Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here and I'm hoping that this conversation is going to be filled with great insight. Yeah, man, be insightful. For those I don't know, I'm not gonna spoil it, but Daniel's story is very, very like it's crazy to say the least. But anyway, Daniel, like, how are you? How's life? Lockdown? Yeah, not too bad, man. Not too bad. Uh enjoying it, making the most of it. Um, grateful for the fact that I'm still able to play sport and still able to do what I love, of course. Um you know, and if we think about this pandemic and all the struggles and all the, uh, the adversities and the changes and circumstances that's brought to the table, you know, what can you really complain about if you still if you still have a roof over your head and all those yeah. things that you need necessary for survival? So, you know, just thinking about like how grateful I am and how grateful for the things I do have in life. So, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing to complain about over here, let's say the least. That's good to hear, man. And how's that? training bins because obviously when lockdown happened you couldn't train I guess couldn't go to the gyms couldn't link up how has that whole process gone uh to be fair no we we have actually been able to train um lucky we have a facility that's flexible and so we we had the facility has a gym uh we're able to use and stuff like that and we also have like a sports hall where we can shoot and practice and all sorts of stuff so um yeah you know it's not it's not been too bad you know it's been it's actually been quite blessed. Like, honestly, it's been quite blessed because I'm sure there's some clubs that depend on certain facilities out that where they don't have that facility to train and they, because of lockdown, as you said, like, they closed down mm-hmm. and stuff. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, no, it's been good, man. It's been it's, like, it's been actually good still. And and also, too, like, the players that we have, you know, work ethic and, and, and just how much everybody wants to get after it is also a bonus. You know, it's just trying to string those wins that we need in order to feel good about ourselves as a team yeah and have you picked up any hobbies during the lockdown period like the first lockdown when you couldn't play any basketball uh have i picked up any hobbies yeah. uh well what it depends what you want to consider well i guess it is what, what it's hobby. i mean i usually like do reading and stuff oh, yeah, um this is some podcasts meditate you know, meditate isn't a hobby that's like essential <laughs> For the mind of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I haven't picked, well, I've kind of picked up a little bit on like, I don't know, creating a little bit of content, but just for fun, you know, like, I don't know, like, like for example, me and my girlfriend, we started up like a food page yeah. and uh, we just got into that a little bit and was creating some content around some of the food that was making and just trying to like promote like plant based diets as a way of le- living and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that was quite interesting. I picked up a lot of cooking, love cooking. And then, you know, now we're at home and stuff, like in lockdown, especially like now you really can't go out and go eat anywhere. So you have to cook at home. Yeah. Uh, and those processed meals ain't going to do the job or ain't going to get the job done. <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. You know, those, those frozen, those frozen ready meals and stuff. So, yeah. um, but yeah, yeah, it's just, let's say, um, I wanted to get into a little bit of gardening, but of course, like where we live, we don't have a garden sort of thing, but it's still like just the idea of thinking, oh, well, maybe I could do this and maybe I could do that. So trying to like uh, fancy it up a little bit in the back back of our place of where we live in. So, but yeah, other than that, um, yeah, no, I've really picked up anything like new to say the least. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's interesting. But anyway, mm. let's go to your journey, Daniel. Now, you've got a very strong American accent, but you're not actually born in America, are you? You're born in London. Yeah, yeah, I actually am. Um, and it's quite interesting because people always ask me, oh, you sound American. What part of America are, are you from? And I'm like, well, it's a long story, but I was actually born in, uh, in, in London, as you say. And I was, to be specific, I was actually born in South London in Greenwich. Ooh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, South London, cheese yeah, man. Yeah. Hey, big up to this, big up to everybody from South London. Come you know, on, you know, <laughs> come on, man. And people, people, we underestimate in South London. You know, it's beautiful, man. It's the best part yeah, of London. Beautiful. That's all we need to it know. It is, it is. It's the it's the grimy part, but people make it out of the grimy part to get to a certain level. You know. Yeah. But yeah, so born in South London, and um, 
yeah, I moved around a lot. So I went from we went. We, it's just me and my mom, by the way. So we moved from like Gre- we moved from Greenwich or Abbeywood uh, to like Twickenham, and then we ended up in Norbury, uh, not yeah. too far away from yeah, not yeah, yeah, not too far away from where my mom stays now, actually. And um, yeah, we stayed there. We, we moved around like not even just within London, but also in and out of England as well. We went to America a, few, a couple of times. Went to Nigeria a couple of times. So. Uh, had kind of like different experiences moving different places and so um at the age uh, at well at the age of 11 like after moving back and forth so many times like this is we we moved to america and this was like our third time moving there and so uh we we st- we we went through we we ended up going to boston uh and initially i thought oh okay, we might be going to like New York or Florida or Texas where we have family members. Yeah. But unfortunately, like we wasn't going in, we wasn't going to any of those places. So at the age of 11, you're kind of confused because you're like, okay, well, what else are we doing here sort of thing? Mm. And so, um, and so, you know, a couple of days go by after landing in Boston and then we end up in Las Vegas, uh, take a three day Greyhound bus trip, you know. Three days. <sighs> Three days, three days on the bus. Imagine three days on the National Express. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's mad, you know. But uh, yeah, so we ended up moving to, we ended up going to Las Vegas after this three three day long bus trip. And and then we ended up kind of like in the space of where like, like, I don't know, like, what are we doing here? Like, generally, what are we doing here? And so um, after, getting to Boston, after getting to Las Vegas, you know, a couple hours after we get to the bus station, we just sat there for like three hours, three, four hours and time's going by and still nothing. And out of nowhere, uh, this random lady just comes and sits next to my mom and they start talking. And then before we know it, you know, a couple hours after talking, uh, we end up leaving the bus station and finding like some sort of random accommodation, um, like a flat basically, or renting a flat for a week. And I think they was doing it by like weekly payments. And so, uh, yeah, we st- so we stayed in this flat for, for like a week or so. And then after that, it's like things just suddenly changed and turned around. And we ended up moving um, from a flat and then instantly becoming homeless. And, mm-hmm. you know, before I knew it, like, it was, qu- it's like, I was quickly, quickly humbled. And before we knew it, we had a new set of changed circumstances. And so, um from a flat to then living in a shelter was like an eye-opening experience you know just the first time you're on the borderline of homelessness but you you have you're sleeping in a building where you know of course you can be accommodated um so then you know stayed in stayed in the shelter for a few months or a couple of months and I was going to school at the time fortunate enough um but then, you know, it, it was still that realization that you, you're in school, but then you don't actually have a normal home to go to. So, mm-hmm. and every time you go back to where you're staying, you're staying in like a building where there's people who, you know, have kids or people who are in like these sort of random situations or people who probably have, a, who have addiction to something. You just, mm-hmm. just never know. And so, um, you know, it is that kind of, thing where you couldn't really do nothing about it so you just have to kind of I guess adjust or adapt to the new change and then after a few months we ended up going to Los Angeles and um, Los Angeles was quite interesting because I'd never been here before don't know what never have heard of this place you heard of LA you know and it no, never heard of LA not at the age of 11 no of course not <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, no, I, I'm listen. I never heard only if you, if you're a kid in England and you hear about America, the only place you hear about is New York. You know, you don't hear you, New York and maybe Florida. Well, at least <laughs> back then, because of the army, because of the movie. And, yeah, yeah, that that is very true. But then there's that movie. There's that movie coming to America, and that's based in New York, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, you know, it's just it's just one of those things. Like you didn't, you don't think nothing else exists far beyond New York, but despite there's a whole world there's another big world out there so yeah anyway uh we get to los angeles and yeah we're going through this sort of misunderstanding sense of this journey and what's going on and um we're staying in and out of different shelters and 
from place to place and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I know this is a bit of a long story, but I'm going to try and put it in a nutshell. No, you can so, explain it. You, you got time. You got time? Okay. Yeah, Depends yeah, yeah. on how much time you want. <laughs> enough time, bro. So, no limit. Enough time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Get, okay. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah, we end up moving to Skid Row, uh, moving, to Lo- moving to Los Angeles, and we come across this area in Los Angeles called Skid Row. Yeah, now, for the first time, Skid Row, uh, at the age of 11, 12, somewhere between there, you, it's like this is what where I just came from in Las Vegas, but times twenty type thing. You know, it's like like it's 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 people on the streets uh, sleeping in cardboard boxes, using uh, shopping carts or shopping baskets as like foundations for a small house, and putting a cardboard box over the top with like a a, a sort of um, duvet to for for the front door sort of thing mm-hmm. um you know there's there's this there's people that are walking around looking like they they're just in a state you know and it's it's kind of unfortunate to look at uh you have people who are are addicted to again substance abuse and all sorts of things that don't actually you know promote any sort of uh health and well-being yeah. um and then and then not only that like not only are you just observing the people but the environment uh the, there's like this stench in the air like literally i'm not I'm, I'm not lying to you there's there's a stench in the air where it's it's like it's hard to breathe like it's mm. i don't know if you ever been to like i don't know um glastonbury festival or something like that and you know when you're walking past the toilets you know exactly yeah you know what that is it's it's like that but in this whole area, you know, it's it's kind of it's, it's a bit it's a bit uh un- interesting, and so, you know, walking through that, it's just like, you know, part of you is just thinking, I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> this this isn't. I know I've seen better. You know, this isn't a place that I think is suitable for me and suitable for my like morals and conditions, and so. um yeah, but at the end of the day, it was still I was still going to school and stuff. Even when I was going to school, uh, it was still coming back to this reality and just there's like no way out of it. There's no escape. Yeah. Um. So anyway, after staying a couple months there and going back and, uh, and, and moving around a little bit within Los Angeles, we ended up going back to Las Vegas, experiencing everything all over again. Mm. But now this time, you know, there's even much more like worse or sort of. Uh, experiences in terms of like one day uh my my mother like I guess she knew somebody somewhere so we go on this bus trip like a local bus trip but it was like an hour to get there we get there uh we leave around we leave from like downtown Las Vegas six o'clock and we get there like eight o'clock seven eight o'clock somewhere around there and um we ended up getting there the person that she thought lives there doesn't live there anymore and so uh someone had called the police and said oh these people are trespassing or soliciting or whatever the police came told us we need to get off the property otherwise we're going to be sent to jail Mm -hmm. so we're like oh snaps okay well we got to get out of here anyway we 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 got like a shopping basket because we had so much luggage and that bus trip that we took from downtown las vegas uh and and got to the spot we like literally walked that back and that took us I don't even know it took us a while like it took us a good day and a half or so like we were stopping in different places Mm. um like like sleeping outside churches and like walking down the street for and however long was walking it down for um and then and then uh what's what else we ended up stopping at a park and trying to figure out like what to do next like literally we had nowhere to go so we're just kind of like legit like yeah. living living rough freestyling um and, say that again freestyling like the way you're living just like how it comes yeah yeah exactly exactly and you know it's just there's times there's there was nights we was walking walking past like a, a hospital and uh we walk through the we walk past the hospital and I'm like, Mom, can we go in there? Can we at least like lay down or stop somewhere? She's like, No, we just gotta keep on going, sort of thing. And I'm just like, you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't even fathom, I couldn't even fathom how how frustrated I was every time I heard no when we could have like seek some indoor shelter and stuff like that. So um anyway, 
that's that's just a story, but there's much more that could come. I'm not gonna dive into too much of it. Um, but anyway, so after staying in Las Vegas and experiencing, you know, uh, some severe adversity, we ended up going back to Los Angeles, California, experiencing everything all over again in terms of homelessness and you know, sleeping on random places. A lot of a lot of times I was like trying to run away. I was like trying to find somewhere or find somebody that I know who would be happy to like take me in and stuff because I would be damned if I was going to be sleeping in a shelter in the heart of Skid Row again tonight. You know, it was, mm-hmm. there was that point where I'm like, all right, this is enough. Like, you gotta, there's got to be something better. So, um, after and then, okay, after a few months living there again, we ended up, we ended up going... Now, this time we end up trying to get to Florida, okay? Um, but, however, we came in on a 30-day or three-month visa. I can never get this right because I know there's some 30-day visas and I know there's some three-month visas. So, yeah. But I think it might have been 30 days. Um, so we came in on a 30-day 30 30 visa, but by this time, in an attempt to get to Florida, we had stayed... Uh, in America for like eight months, eight, nine months by now, you know, oh, we're wow. declared like legal, illegal, illegal immigrants, I guess. And so we get, so we take this bus trip from Los Angeles, California and attempt to get to Florida, but then we get stopped in Texas yeah, and uh, by immigration, unfortunately, and make a long story short, uh, we got stopped middle of nowhere in Texas. Like I'm dead at like, dead serious like if you're on a motorway right and did just picture this you're on a motorway mm-hmm. and there's just nothing but like desert and sand around sort of thing or just that like country. all land like country like no there's no there's no buildings there's no rivers there's absolutely nothing like you're in the heart of nowhere and there's this port and um yeah we literally got to this and and I remember looking out the window, seeing uh, the U- United States Homeland Security, whatever they're saying is. And uh, I was like, oh, no. Like, there's that, you know, when that that, that heartbeat is like, do-do, yeah. do-do. <laughs> like, you're bracing for something because you know this is going to be a pretty outcome. So um, we get out. We so, so, so the officers, okay, bus stops, whatever, officers come onto the bus and they, they're saying, uh hello guys we're such and such we're here to just check your papers and make sure you guys have your proper documents and stuff if you guys don't have proper documents you'd be asked to get off the bus and by that time i just knew it like yeah we're not we're, <laughs> like, we're there's off. that there's that yeah yeah we're getting off like there's not even a debate about this so they get to my mom they asked her that they actually spent more time on my mom than they did with anybody else and uh, I remember, like, my mom was sitting, like, a few seats or a few rows in front of me. And then she looked back and said, yeah, there's my son or whatever. And they basically asked her to get up and get off. And then they come to me and tell me I need to get up and get off as well. And I get off the bus, grab the bash from underneath the bus. And that was it. Like, the bus was gone. And now it's just me and my mom, all this luggage. And we're facing this sort of, uh, we're facing this immigration court. And it was like, it was almost like just like your hopes is shattered you know mm. and like your hopes because you knew like what you what what the outcome was actually trying to go for probably would have been the right thing and the best thing and at least there might have been something there for us and so um but unfortunately it, that it didn't happen so yeah we get we we spent some time in this port stay here for a couple of hours or a few hours and then we get sent back to el paso and we stayed in El Paso for four weeks, and then we stuck. Uh, uh, and we 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 saw an immigration officer, and the immigration officer within those four weeks told us that you guys have been in in America for longer than your time using your visa. Mm. Uh, so you guys, uh, we're gonna have to deport you guys back to England. But they didn't wow. send us right then, back right then and there. And so imagine at, at like twelve years old, like you're going through this sort of crazy like moment of life and you're like yo i didn't ask for any of this like (laughs) like like this like what and now it's like you you almost feel defenseless you feel defenseless because you have absolutely nothing to fall back on you know it's kind of like that recipe for you know there's there's those 
people could perceive tough times in one of one or two ways they could either look at it as something that's you know telling them that they're just not good enough and it never will be or they can look at it and say you know okay i'm gonna we're gonna rise above this occasion one way or the other sort of thing um so but then okay so so then okay after that whole meeting and everything it was like going back to where we're staying that day and just thinking like what are we going to do now yeah so uh my mom uh we end up going back to los angeles and it, it didn't get any better from there you know it's just i spent more time away and sleeping and like i almost felt like i spent more time away from my mom and trying to find somewhere to sleep or sleeping on buses trains and Damn. you know all sorts of random areas um rather than actually trying to find solutions that's what that's what it almost felt like so anyway uh there was one day this but then again this is where like life like took a complete 180 so um i was i ended up meeting my mom after being out all night by myself right and this is where like i don't know so oh, sorry what i mean i don't know so anyway, i met up with my mom and uh we ended up going to where my mom was going to or we ended up trying to go to where my mom was heading to and so um which was a shelter in san fernando and we ended up leaving uh one of like the biggest shelters in 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 the hardest skill road called on union rescue mission and we was just walking and uh there was a shelter not too far away from where we just left that was serving food at the time and so I asked my mom, mom, can we go in here and get some food? And uh, she said, no. And so I was like, you know, Why? there's this part where I just, oh, yeah, you know, I just had to kind of figure out one or two things. Like, you know, it's either, okay, she said, no, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to go down this road and which has, hasn't been successful or, you know, with all this sort of like, uncertainty and you know like just just unfortunate misfortune sort of events and moments and stuff and that's been frustrating i could have been that could have made me angry or whatever or am i just gonna go in here to the shelter get some food and and just kind of like go again just it's just another day for me and just kind of roll with it um so yeah so i decided to go into the show to get some food my mom didn't turn my mom didn't turn around and come back to come back for me right so going to show to get some food uh 20 30 minutes later come out and all i have is like this 150 to 200 gallon trash bag like over my back just mm-hmm. filled with clothes you know no money no phone uh no bus pass no nothing like literally you know just hanging on to dead life right now yeah. And so uh, I remember making a right out of the shelter and making a left down the main street. And um, I ended up walking to the corner of that street. And what I see next is completely unbelievable. So I see that my mom is on the bus, on the bus heading to where she wanted to go to, right? Yeah. And so I'm standing here trying to assess the whole situation and like, what do I do? And so I look to the left and a little bit down the street, there's this uh, bus stop. So I'm thinking, okay, the bus mate, the bus is going to get to the bus stop. You know, do I run after the bus or does my mom get off? But instead I just stood there like paralyzed, just trying to figure out what's going to happen. Hmm. And so, um, but instead here's what happens. So the bus gets to the bus stop. I see no sign of my mom and the bus just keeps on going. So, now 12 years of age you know being abandoned in one of the toughest places in america Mm, um and 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 and, you know like nothing to fall back on like absolutely nothing didn't know anybody it it was like that sort of either you're gonna get broken you know get broken and stay down or get broken and put the p and pick the pieces up and try to figure it out for yourself sort of thing or is either give up or and become a part of the product or you find you find that sort of i don't know you use your senses and try to attract a proper more i don't know more rewarding sort of outcome or situation so 
you know, and I could have, easily, I could have given up. Like, I could have let that moment get to me. I could have been upset. I could have been frustrated. I could have been mad at the world. I could have said, this is what happened to me. I could have been one of those people that's in Los Angeles now, still home, this sort of thing, you know, and, and sleeping on the streets with. But, but instead, I decided to just look for somewhere to sleep, you know, just at least something like that's going to help me get out of here. Um, and so, yeah, and then I turn, turn to turn into turning the pages of hope now. Uh, I was looking for just somewhere to sleep, so I came across two shelters, mm. and they well, basically, in a nutshell, uh, they, they turned me away because I was under the age of 18, so they wasn't going to be able to help me. So after that second show, I was, again, tested, you know, determined whether, uh, tested, uh, like, whether I was going to be determined enough to keep going or do I quit now, and I didn't. I kept, I just kept going. Uh, got to this third shelter, asked them, you know, if they would be happy to help or if, they, if, they're, going, if they're able to house me. They said no, but make a long story short, they called the police and the uh, police came and picked me up and a few hours go by and uh, they ended up taking me, well, they, they, we ended up trying to go for go on the search for where my mom was, but couldn't find her at all. Mm. And so later on, after an attempt to find my mom, we ended up going to the police station and just sitting there, you know, I just sat there for like five hours, you know, no money, no phone, they feed mom you? ain't here, you know, no, nah, they didn't feed me actually, <laughs> unfortunately. So it would have been great, but you know, it, it was definitely, uh, yeah, yeah, they didn't feed me. It would have been great if they did, though. <laughs> so, anyway, um, a few hours go by, five hours go by, and then by the end of the, like the fifth hour or whatever, this random guy pops up out of nowhere. Uh, and make a long story short, come to find out he's a DCFS worker, Department of Children and Family Services, okay. and um, uh, or social worker essentially and he ends up um you know he ends up just taking me taking me and, and basically telling me like yeah you're in a foster care system now so by the end of that by the end of that day and in that car ride I was just like like it's just I didn't I didn't know what to think I was confused I was like Man, I like, humbled at the same time, but then I was just, I was just intuitively trying to grasp everything. I was, I think I was a bit more worried for my mom because I don't know where she was. I don't know if she's gonna be okay, you know, stuff like that, you know. But yeah, I just, I just part of me was just kind of like, damn, like I just, I didn't know. Like I, I was in, I don't know. I was in shock, disbelief, still trying to get over the day sort of thing and it's almost like it's almost like this ad, this journey of just like of WTF over and over and over again and now all of it just like stopping in the snap of a finger it was like I was still trying to understand like I was still trying to figure out myself like I, I don't know like it, it's hard to actually try to explain that mm. so yeah, I mean, and then to kind of like narrow it down again, like went through the foster care system, you know, uh, six years, six years I was, in, I was in the foster care system for, um, only moved homes twice, uh, started playing sport and stuff like that. And then um, start playing sport and start picking up like school. I had a bit more stability now so I could learn and do all the stuff, other stuff that normal kids would, but then it's still like that aftermath of trying to figure out how to deal with, with the yeah. situ weird situations and there's still that mixed messages like seeing my mom in between and had, knowing that my family then decides to kind of like pop up after everything's happened now it's too late sort of thing and so um you know unfortunately my mom got sent back because she was trying to turn herself in because of that deportation case that i told you about yeah. uh but she didn't because i was in the foster care system well, she turned herself in in hopes of getting me back, but she didn't. Um, I ended up getting a, uh, uh, an attorney to overturn my deportation case. And yeah, I was just granted like my residency and everything I needed just to to be allowed to stay in America now. Um, and so, yeah, it's unfortunate how it happened, you know, and sometimes life just worked out that way. But hey, 
you know, what, what, I guess it's one of those things that it could always be so much more worse. So I was grateful Mm -hmm. for it. Um, but yeah, went through, went through foster care, you know, I had a roof over my head and had a a decent family enough, you know, at least if anything, it was, it was happening, like let me in and kind of take me on like new adventures and try to, you know, show a different way of life, which is great. You know, and I'm happy for that. Um, and then, yeah, started playing basketball, started having a bit of a, uh, a drive for, like, sport a little bit. Uh, of course, one of the, well, I guess every hooper's dream is to try and make the NBA. So, you know, yeah. you kind of want to put in that work and try to do that and stuff. So um, that's what was kind of, like, the main motivation. Uh, graduated high school, played four years in uni, two, two years in junior college in Texas, two years in Iowa State. Um which was which was a good journey, and I think after a while the reality hit that I wasn't going to make the NBA. So now what was I going to do? And so I was like, okay. Uh, throughout my uni uh, years, I ended up meeting, well, knowing, finding out that I have two siblings. You know, my brother and my sister, uh, brothers in London, sisters in Bath. And How did I never you find grew out? up with them. Never really met them before. And my my younger brother texted me on Facebook saying mm-hmm. that, oh, I think we both have the same dad and I was like huh you know so so a question but um yeah so we ended up ended up finding out that I do have a younger sibling and then he ends up telling me oh yeah you have a younger sister as well I was like oh no way that's crazy so you know and I after uh during uni I always told him like if an opportunity in England was to come come up to play basketball or whatever then I'd definitely take it and come and spend some time with you guys so ended up doing that um, well, Bristol ended up coming into the equation, and I found that that Bristol was only literally like twenty five minutes away from Bath, mm-hmm. and literally an hour and a half, two hours away from London. Mm-hmm. So I was like, "Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of like a blessing in hindsight, you know." And I wasn't really worried about like the money or nothing like that. Like I knew I wasn't gonna be coming out of uni making X amount of pounds, whatever. So. I was just like, you know what, as long as I have a roof over my head, a little bit of money coming in, I have some sort of money coming in, and uh, there's some opportunities around, then, hey, it can make things work sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that that worked out. That worked out, and then uh, Bristol came up. See, I took it, and, um, yeah, got a chance to meet up with my sister and spend some time with her and build a relationship over these last few years, also with my brother as well. And then uh, after... After that, we'll see my mom. I haven't seen her in like since 2006 or seven, somewhere around there. Yeah. Because that's when she got sent back from America. So literally, I just saw my mom back in 2015 for oh, the man. first time. So that was a bit, yeah, that was a bit interesting because that? there was some other, how was that? It, oh. Well, it was, it was, a, I had mixed emotions about it because uh, there was the situation with my mom well, with about her housing and her accommodation that just needed like some attention, you know, like this, this sort of, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but there was this sort of, there's this sort of responsibility that kind of felt like was put on me, that I, not put on me intentionally, but that I just had to take upon because like, there's a lot of stuff that needed to be sorted out sort of thing um, from like the state of her accommodation and how it all looked and just, yeah, it was a bit mad. So um, I kind of put that aside and just kind of like put my heart in it and try to like give her the best sort of, try to help her like for a better like sort of result, I guess. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, and ever, and ever since then, I've been going back and forth, going down, you know, trying to help my mom out and connect with family and stuff from time to time. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, just, it's and being in Bristol it's, over these last five years, it's been like, oh, six years, I should say, has been a bit of like a, it's been an interesting journey, you know, like being able to play for England and you know, my head coach being the head coach of England which that's, I guess that's a blessing because yeah. of relationships and stuff. And then just making, building networks here, here in Bristol with like people and, you know, now that I have captaincy uh, as a Bristol Flyers captain, given the fact I've been here for a while and stuff, which is, you know, it's a blessing as well, responsibility. Um, 
and so yeah just and, and not just that but also like going after like my education and stuff like that like being able to do that I'm forever grateful for so you know I still and, and now to this day still just trying to figure out what can I what else can I do you know what else can I do that's gonna be even much more impactful and that's that's the key essence just to like well you know the reasons for being here in Bristol um but yeah, you know, it's just, it's been an interesting journey. You know, my message is, um, I'm always working with young people. So, and even, but even adults as well, like it, it sounds a bit cliche, but never give up. Like, yeah. you know, you just never, never give up as hard as, as, as tempting as it is to throw in a towel and say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore or I can't do this anymore. You know, like if that was my, if that was my sort of, uh, if that was my sort of mindset when, you know, things were hitting the fan. I mean, hitting the fan on a serious note. Then I definitely would not be here right now. You know, that's that's one thing. And, and giving up requires having quite a bit of resilience. But it's also like understanding the obstacles and adversity. They're all just stepping stones to finding that inner strength, you know, to, to keep on going sort of thing. And uh, that's why we can't always like give in to giving up. Otherwise, we'll never get anywhere in the first place. Okay, but you and just, then, oh, okay. just like because you went through it quite quickly, I just wanted to ask about your experience at like junior college and then at Iowa State University. So, like, how was that experience when you started first playing basketball? Like, how, when did you realize that you were quite good at basketball? And like, how did you go from uh, junior college to like Iowa State? Um, huh, okay, question. Uh, so how, when did I realize I was good at basketball? So I started playing basketball when I was 14, 15. Quite and I've, I always had like, I always had like the, the sort of like joy for playing this. Well, I've always had this sort of love hate relationship with basketball, which is, which I guess is quite enjoyable, but also there's sometimes where it's like, oh, I don't want to play this game anymore. But then you like, I love this game. I think from I think what got me into playing the game was when I first made my when I made my first free throw, and I was like, "Oh, went through the net easy," you know. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I just I just enjoyed it. So, uh, so yeah, I started playing AU and was traveling around the country playing basketball and stuff. And I started getting like Division One looks, like the high Division One looks from like different universities and stuff. So I was like, "Oh yeah, you know what, like." If this is what if this is gonna get me a free ride or a free scholarship, you know, to get my education, yeah, of course, take it. Why not? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, it's only good things that come out of it. So um yeah, so then I went to so after graduating from high school, I didn't have a division one scholarship, but I did have well, I did have division one like interests, but that was from like low major to mid major like universities so I kind of wanted to like I don't know I kind of wanted to go high a little bit and I was like damn how am I going to get there so anyway um this random head coach from the junior college in Texas calls me and he says hey is this Danny Dozier I'm like yeah hi I'm the head coach I'm such and such uh, head coach at Tyler Junior College um yeah I've been told I heard a lot about you and you know there's been people that have been talking about talking about you to me so I just wanted to ask about you and stuff and I was like oh yeah, yeah just to, we just had a conversation and he was he was asking me uh he was asking me so yeah we don't do visits um but I can send you the the link and stuff whereas like before I was taking like visits to like Fresno State to um Eastern Washington to, to Montana State all sorts of stuff all sorts of universities so I was like all right um yeah, so I literally just kind of looked online and was like, okay, uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see what this junior college is going to be saying. So I looked online, went through the website. I was like, okay, this is all right. It's one of the top junior colleges in America, actually. Mm-hmm. One of the top, like, for, well, for attendance, that is. I think it's like, well, at the time, it was like thirteen to 14,000 just for junior college. That's quite big. You know, that's, that's larger than any some of the universities here in England and that's just a junior college that's not even a major university so um and so I was like all right um I took took my chance and yeah went with it and yeah one of the best decisions I probably probably made um 
I well, so the the level of playing was a bit interesting. Mm. Uh, we didn't do. I'll be honest. We only touched weight. We only touched. I don't think we even touched weights at all. I'll be honest. We didn't touch weights. We didn't touch weights. We should have. We should have touched. I think we should have touched weights more. But for whatever reason, coach didn't believe that weights was essential. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, like, I, but I would get in the weight room and push weights from time to time, um, but and and stuff like that. But I'll be honest, I wish I would have touched weights more. Like, literally, we had a gym and stuff, and we'll go in, you know, or I'll go in, do some, do whatever, you know, do whatever I needed to try and like get stronger, bigger, faster, whatever. Um, but anyway, uh, what was I about to say? So yeah. So yeah, uh, but our training, we only trained for like an hour a day. Uh, sometimes, some, well, early in the season, it was like maybe an hour and a half, two hours. But then as the season went on, we only, we only practiced an hour a day. Okay. So that was it. But then the thing was, okay, got to Iowa State and we practiced like two to three hours. So that kind of adjustment that Seriously. physical adjustment was like, oh my god! And the pressure was completely different. The expectations were different. The competition was different. The coaching was different. You know, where it was like before from a junior college, it was just the head coach and a couple of assistants. But then when we got to, we got to Iowa State. You have the head coach. You have the assistant coaches. You have the trainers. You have the student uh, uh, staff or the student trainers. And then you have like, you have like SSC coach. You have so all of it at once was like cheese like all right and only only had two years here at this university so i had to pick up on things or try to pick up things as quickly as i can yeah so um so yeah but it it was it was quite intense uh when we got to iowa state but eventually you get used to it Mm -hmm. and yeah and not only just not only just that but then also like traveling uh, some some we play we play random game we we play games at any day of the week we have Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday and they could either be home or away I remember one time we had we had and you know like when you get to a certain level like you're flying everywhere sort of thing so we had um one we had I think we had like Baylor on a Sunday on a Saturday. And then we had, so we had a game on Saturday and we had to fly the next day to go play West Virginia on a Monday. And then we, we so we're flying back. We're flying back at like one, two o'clock in the morning, landing, landing back in Iowa um, at like three in the morning sometimes and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a bit mad. Like, yeah, it was, no, it was fun though. It was actually quite fun because we, we managed to like, yeah, we we'll, well we have fun during the season, and then when it came to like conference championships and like that sort of run, like we we're, we we're playing in Kansas City, and we won um, back-to-back oh. conference titles mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, which is quite fun, you know. We're playing with playing with our fans. Fans were amazing. Like I say, our fans was well. Ooh, that's that's actually quite debatable controversial but as a, to me i'm biased so my <laughs> our fans were, our fans were the best fans cyclone nation you know the most liveliest fans you can ever like like uh like like that the atmosphere the atmosphere was so electrifying that it just you like oh like you, you couldn't feel one ounce of your own body you know mm-hmm. what I mean? <laughs> so um but yeah no it, it was actually it was actually really good and, then, and they were so supportive like with everything you did and stuff like that. So, but then again, you know, sport isn't everybody loves when you're doing, yeah. when you're playing sport, but the moment you stop doing it, then people forget about you. So, yeah. But it was, a, it was no, it was. Uh, okay. I was going to say, like, speak about the players that you were there with, because obviously we know that NBA players like Monte Morris was at the same uni you was at. And which other players did you come across when you was at Iowa State for like, other teams as well? Yeah, so you have George Niang, um, as you said, Monte, Monte Morris, Naz Long. I, he was in the NBA, but I don't know where he is now. Uh, Matt Thomas was another one. Uh, Abdul Nader, who plays for Phoenix Suns, I believe. Uh, Deontay Burton, who plays for Oklahoma Thunder. But I didn't play with him. He, he played, he started playing the year after I left. 
uh, who else? Who else? Matt Thomas. Matt Thomas, Nazno, George Nader, Monty Morris, Abdul Nader, Deontay Burton. I want to. I want to say there's one more. No, not my Yeah. No. You know what? Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Bryce DeJean Jones. Well, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, he passed away. But yeah, that was another play that uh, I played with as well. So yeah, it's quite a few players. Quite a few players. And could you see like these were NBA level players, or was it like you were all equal in, in a sense? Um, it's not even seen that they were NBA players. Honestly, it's like seeing the kind of like work ethic, like. George Nee, all those guys I just mentioned, like those guys were in the gym, like faithfully. They were in the faithfully, like it wasn't, it wasn't one day where I didn't see them in the gym getting shots up, or they was working on some skill work stuff, or they was in the weight room like working out. Like these guys, their, their work ethic was a bit was insane, but hey, you know what? That it's insane in a good way. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, I thought I thought it was there was actually they 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 understood the game, they understood where to get shots from. They all trusted and believed in each other, which makes that and that sort of team chemistry or that sort of aspect like brought together that sort of um, unity needed to like win certain games and stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they all got on well. It was all like I guess brothers in a sense and. Had all, all all good on all had like good relationship, real good relationships with each other. So, yeah, um, yeah you know, I, I, and I thought like, yeah, the guys they they, they, were, they were destined to go. So if, and even if they didn't go to the NBA, they was definitely going to play in Europe. Like, yeah. I think um, that's the route that Matt Thomas took, and then he went. He played somewhere in Italy, and then he ended up. Uh, get an opportunity to play with Toronto Raptors and now I think he's with them if I'm not mistaken I think he's with them um, Martin Morris uh, any, anyone all the other guys I don't think they was going to go into Europe though although they could have they yeah. just stayed humbled and continued playing like the G League and stuff like that and um, yeah they ended up being called up to play for the NBA team mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. look where they are now yeah and also, I was going to say, um, you said how you, when you went to Bristol, you said how you like your sister being in the bath was an influencing factor. Did you ever think of playing summer league after the, the draft and thinking, oh, let me try and get the NBA in that way? Or was you intent on coming to England? Oh, you're talking about after I finished uni? Yeah, after you finished uni, I was staying. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Was I intent? It was, yeah. <sighs> I kind of, I had it in mind a little bit, but then I was just still, honestly, I was still kind of like, I was, I was actually trying to, I was actually dealing with a lot, like emotionally and mentally. Mm. And so um, I think as the time went by, I was just kind of like, you know, whatever happens is whatever happens. Like I'm still going to train. Yeah. I still train. If I make, if I get an opportunity to play in the, in the D league or whatever, then great. Or play on the, on the summer league team, then great. But if not, then it's, it'll be like kind of seeing what other opportunities around. And thankfully, I mean, God opened opportunities in other places that I would not have even, even imagined. Like the way that Bristol came into the picture was, was, it came in a way unexpected. So when, uh, so there's a sort of like showcase that I played in mm-hmm. and the coach, for the team that I was playing on and knew the head coach of the Bristol Flyers. Mm-hmm. And so he put me in touch with him and it kind of like worked that way. And we was exchanging like, I don't know, conversation and stuff like that. And yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of came up that way. And like, and then I took, I just took Bristol as a, as an offer. Yeah. So it just, yeah. So that's how, so then, yeah, that's how it kind of worked out. I mean, but then again, trying to play on a summer league team or uh, some uh, D League team or whatever, yeah, yeah, that would have been that would have been a bit interesting. But then it was, it was just a challenge as well. Like, yeah, I had all the connections and had all the sort of relationships that probably or potentially could help me get there. But I was like, you know what, you know, I just just I I guess kind of God has a way of like like uh, you know that's 
I don't know. Maybe there's selected few that you don't really know the reasons as to why you're actually here, but somehow God opens up these weird random doors in weird ways. Yeah. And you're like, you, you walk into the door and you don't even think to like, look back, just mm-hmm. keep moving forward sort of thing. So that's how I look at it. Like, yeah, although like going down some league route may have, may not have been there. Well, this opportunity came up that, and, and this opportunity came up in a way that probably some of the wouldn't have paid off or wouldn't have given you, I guess. So, uh-huh. yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you get to Bristol, you're living in Bristol, your debut season, you lead the BBR on rebounds. Speak about that. Like, you just came and shut it down. Like, <laughs> really good bear style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's first year with Bristol. Um, yeah, I did. I didn't even know I was actually leading in rebounds I'll be honest I don't remember well I didn't know I was and it got to a point where my coaches was like oh yeah you know you're like second in rebound in the league and stuff I was like oh really it's like yeah it was like between me and um oh what's that old boy's name from Sheffield uh I can't remember his name he was like Robinson or something something like that I can't remember his last name but yeah it was like I like I don't know 10.3 10.3 at one point he had like 10.1 and it was like it was like sometimes it's going like back and forth between between us two and stuff but then uh as the season went on you know I was like taking off in terms of like rebounds I was grabbing anything and everything <laughs> the paint. so and that's 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 but that yeah that's it like owning the paint like this is my house these are my board these are my boards so you better get out the way sort of thing um, and that was just because, like, after coming out of uni, because of the way I was built physically, like, mm. like I was like two sixty, like just, just a just just a cannon, like, <laughs> like if you if you ask Kieran Achara, um, you know, if you ask him about my first my first year, my season with the Bristol Flyers first year, he would tell you, yeah, he was strong, like. I'm uh, still strong now, but he was strong where like you just could not keep him out the paint, like. If if he's going for a rebound, like <laughs> don't even try to box him out because <laughs> he's just gonna get get over you and you know go for it, whatever. So, um, but yeah, I think the most I grabbed in terms of, of rebounds was like like nineteen, seventeen or nineteen, someone or something like that. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's other players that have grabbed more rebounds, you know, over the years. But yeah, I guess as a as a as a as a rookie. As a yes, first yeah. first year guy, yes, that's my numbers. Yeah, and also speak about how you became captain of the Bristol Flyers. That's a, that's a big achievement. Like you're the leader, you're the first person. Like people look up to you in that sense. Like how did that feel when you became, and how did it come about as well? Uh, so this is my third season cap of captaincy. So my coach just gave. So basically, after Greg Street left. It was then Mike Vigor became captain, and Mike Vigor was away the following season when he came back um, because of like I guess injury or resting or something like that. So he said, "Yeah, he just asked me, hey Dan, you know, just wanted to ask ask you, um, you know, about captaincy and whether or not you have to be a captain and stuff." And I'm like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" And yeah, the coach just asked me. I was like, "Yes." Yeah, and um yeah, and then it just from there it was just like first year captaincy was when it was what 2018, 19 season. And um it was interesting because like, yeah, there's that responsibility of knowing how to lead a team, how to work in a team and how to get guys on the same page. But then I'm still learning as a captain now, you know, and, yeah. and still like um lessons to be learned I mean, captaincy is never a set way there's always different things coming up and sometimes you don't always have the answers mm. in that moment all the time so um yeah it was it was like yeah work with passionate like it was it was a good achievement like you know young guys had have enough experience like played england and went through all sorts of systems playing in like america and stuff like that um, I had a bit of confidence about myself and I was starting to learn the game differently and stuff like that. And so 
And so, um, yeah, I, th- I think I had a good head on my shoulders. You know, as long as you have a captain with a good head on the shoulders, then you're all good, you know. Uh, but then it was, it, it, it was, it was when the table started, slowly started to turn after first year, we went on like the 7-0, 7-0 win streak. And then uh, we ended up having, well, we ended up starting to lose a couple of games here and there. And before we know it, we just went on this massive losing streak and we just could not get over the hump. We was like number one in the league and stuff, but then I was still trying to figure out what to this day, like got us to that point where we was just, we just could not win a game. Like we went from winning one, two, three, like seven in a row to then like losing 13, 14 in a row before we could win our first game sort of thing. And yeah, it was quite, it's quite interesting because I was like, damn, like what is going to like, it's again, it's a lesson to be learned, you know, and that basically is complacency. You never get too comfortable with where you are because anything mm-hmm. can happen at any given time. So, um, yeah, our season was in the post, but then last year, second season as a captain, um, you know, it's kind of like a bit more out there, a bit more extroverted, a bit more like, like leader, leader sort of orientated. But then I know, like, I'm, I'm just like, I'm. Like, however, like me being captain does not change me as a player or as a person. It's not like, oh, yeah, I got this element of power. Oh, yeah, I'm going to abuse it sort of thing. You just got to know when to be and how to be in certain moments. And um, that's that's something I definitely learned, like, last year because of, like, prior experiences. And you just know that when, okay, you know, based on reflection, you know, how you was then okay let's not be that way let's try and like oh you, know, you realize that when this happens again that you know how to like stand up a bit more be a yeah. bit more like, like you know i guess out there um but yeah second years as a captain made a bbl cup you know yeah. championship final which is great would have been amazing if we won that but yeah. I kind of came up short the wolves. but hey that's okay yeah <laughs> yeah what's the wolves won it uh, we shouldn't have came up short, but we did. But that's okay, though. You know, everything's. Hey, it's a it's a blessing, you know, to be to be in that position. Um, and then this year, it's just been like understanding personalities and like I think I'm maturing a bit more in the game now. Mm. Um, so I'm just I'm being me, but at the same time, still learning as I go. Sometimes I think the thing is with captaincy, like your voice isn't always the voice that needs to be heard at times. Sometimes there's other guys that have different voices and people respond to that voice differently. So sometimes you got to like put your sort of pride aside and your whatever status you have on the team aside and just kind of like work with that person as well, you know, sort of thing. So I'm still learning that, still um, still like considering that as a learning lesson and something that's beneficial as well. It's like, it helps to like have balance on the team, you know? Um, so it's kind of like, that's the way I look at it. Uh, but yeah, you know, now as a captain, it's still just makes sure my head, my my shoulder, my head on my shoulders is good and trying to make sure that everyone else's is okay. You know, try to keep the positive energy there from time to time whenever we need it. So, you know, it's just, as there's that kind of like aspects to being a captain. Yeah. Oh, interesting, interesting. Now let's move on to the knowledge bit. You say you're okay. an NBA fan. So, there's going to be six questions. The last question is a bonus point question, which is worth five points. The first five questions are worth five points, but have a bonus point on each question. So oh, so this one, is like a quiz? Yeah, like a quiz. I do it to all my guests. So. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Question oh, I'm not ready for this. Okay, let me, yeah. let, me get my, let me get my knowledge cap on then. All right. Yeah. Question number one. You say you, you told me before you was a LeBron James fan, isn't it? So let's see if you know about him. Okay. Which season did LeBron James have his highest points per game? I'll, I'll give you options. Don't worry. Is it A, okay. 2009-10 season, B, 2007-2008 season, C, 2005-2006 season, or D, 2008-2009 season? Definitely not. I would say he didn't have no. He was averaging. He's he's always averaged between twenty seven to about thirty one points a game. So trying to figure out what years he would. I feel like it might have been his. Did you say his oh eight oh nine season? 
yeah, the, that's an option. Don't three the options there again. No, nah, well, no, no, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, please, yeah. please do. I feel like so, 08, 09 season, something yeah. tells me it's that one. 08, Quite 09, 05, 06, 07, 08, or 09, 010. 09, 010. Was that when he was with Miami? 010. No, that was or that was when he was with, no, was that his last year? Yeah, that was last year in Cleveland, yeah, yeah. Because last year in Cleveland, yeah. ooh, that's tough. Wait a minute. Last year in Cleveland, before he went to Miami, what happened then? No, he did, they got knocked out by Boston Celtics, didn't they? Yeah, Garnett done his thing on him, yeah. Garnett, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm, it's either 08, 09, or, or 09, or 10 season. Let's go 08, 09 season. 08, 09. Is that your final answer? Yeah. It's wrong. <laughs> oh, damn. Which, was, which season it, was it? It actually is 05 06. That's his best is it? points per game season. Yeah. Yeah. No way. How much did he average that season? Oh, and, to the, and that's for the bonus point. If you tell me how much he averaged, you get a bonus point. How, if I tell you how much he averaged, 29.5. Yeah. <laughs> close, close. It was 31.4. 31.4? Yeah, and 0506. Oh, yeah. no way. Okay, okay. Yeah. I learned, hey, I learned something new. Fair enough. Okay, this one's a good question. When Ray Allen hit the clutch three point nine in 2013 to save LeBron's legacy, <laughs> how much time was there left on the clock? Do you remember that shot, Ray Allen? What? After he shot the ball, before he yes. shot the ball? So when he shot it and it went in, mm. and because I think they, to check if it was a three pointer, they just stopped it. How many seconds were left? I got options. Was it no it was seconds? It was... Was it... Oh, I'll, I'll give you options. Was it uh, no seconds left? Oh, yeah, yeah, go. 2.3 seconds, 5.2, or 4.5? Less than two seconds. So it's no more than two. Definitely no more than two. So, but it wasn't, it was still like enough. Like when you say no seconds, like it was zero. Or yeah, you say like it was like 0.4 on the clock. No seconds means buzzer beat R, it ended. O- overtime. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like two. It was like two seconds on the shot clock then. So you're gonna go for two point three seconds. Yeah, because I felt like San Antonio had a chance to either try and get a shot off. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, it's two point. Yeah, it's two point three seconds. That's your final answer. <laughs> yeah, it's wrong. Sorry to say that. <laughs> Oh, dang, man. Jeez, what was it? 5.2 seconds were left on Real and hit the three-pointer. Was it actually up time left? Oh, damn. Was it actually... Was, wait, was it... Okay, fair enough. No, I think no, was... That's when you were... Was it... Uh... No, there was no shot clock, was it? No, no, yeah, of course, no shot clock. 5.2 left. So, they, they had it. Antonio had a yeah, position. Yeah. I think it was Parker. He tried to hit and he missed. So, yeah. Did it? Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. But for the bonus point, seconds, yeah. Yeah. for the bonus point, what was the final score of that of that match? Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> that's tough. That's tough. It was in the nineties, wasn't it? No, go ahead. You give me the options. Oh, there's no options for this one. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. So I ain't got options for this. It was. It was in the nineties. No, or was it in the hundreds? Uh, I feel like it was because it was it was the three point shot was what gave him either a one or two point lead. Yeah, because it was trying to get a three off because they needed it. Yeah, so I, I feel like it. I feel like it was no. Actually, I think it might have been one or two. I feel like it might have been ninety ninety five ninety four something like that. Is that your final answer? It's my final guess. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're wrong again. This is Daniel. What's going on? Oh, man, them. you should ask me to go down memory lane, man. The point, James is one of his biggest games he's ever been involved in. Mm. But yeah. What was it? 103, 100. 103, 100. Okay. Well, hey, I did say, was it in the 100s or was it like in the 90s? Yeah. On, you got you to gotta give a little bit. Of, you got you to gotta yeah. give a little bit of knowledge, man. This one, yeah, I understand. this one, you might get. In 2007-2008 season, 
Boston Celtics won the NBA championship. But who did they defeat in the finals? Was it the Spurs, the Lakers, the Jazz, or the Rockets? Lakers. Any final answer? This is a 2008-2009 finals, yeah. right? The 2008 finals, 08. 08 finals. Yeah. And who was it again? Sorry, the teams? Let me, let, me just, let me just hear these teams. Spurs, Lakers, Utah Jazz, or the Rockets, Houston. Spurs, Lakers, Utah Jazz. Utah Jazz have not made it to the finals. Uh, you said Rockets. Rockets yeah. ain't made it to the finals. Uh, Spurs last time it, ooh, last time they went to the finals definitely Tony Parker managing Obi that was there they play, play. oh yeah. I'm just trying to figure out last time they went to the finals I actually can't think of anything top of my head but definitely it, might have, it definitely would have been the Lakers though should have been the, it should be the Lakers if I get this wrong then damn I quit <laughs> is that your final answer? <laughs> yeah yeah, Lakers are correct. Lakers are correct. Okay, okay, okay. Got to the to test my nose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have to give you an easy one. If you've got that one, I would have been like, oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, I definitely am not then. <laughs> for the bonus point, who was finals MVP of that finals? For the bonus point, who was the finals MVP of that finals? Uh, 08 season, yeah? 07, 08 season? Uh... So Celtics... I couldn't... Celtics beat the Lakers. Yeah, in 08. This was, yeah. Ooh, it, it definitely would have been, ooh, one or two people. Paul Pierce is definitely up there for sure. Oh, no. Yeah, that should be Paul Pierce. Yeah, Paul Pierce. Yeah, it's Paul Pierce. It's Paul Pierce. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yep. Celtics even <sighs> score around, but it, sh- it should have been Garnett. I can't lie. Garnett, you... He was good. But, yeah, hey. definitely. He was Question a killer. Question number four. Oh, man, this is making me nervous, man. Can't lie. The, the bonus question at the end is very difficult. I can't lie. I might be the, But we'll get to that. <laughs> number four. This is one's quite hard. Which NBA team sent four players to the All-Star game in 2015? Was it A, Golden State Warriors, B, Atlanta Hawks, C, Houston Rockets or D Cleveland. And you said this is 2015 uh, All Star. Yeah, 2015 All Star game. Which team sent four players? Was it the Warriors, the Hawks, the Rockets, or the Cavs? Well, if it Cavs didn't have, oh wait a minute. If the Cavs had anybody, it would have been well. Definitely, it would have been LeBron. It would have been Kyrie, Kevin Love. I want to say, and potentially, ooh, who's, who would have been the other one with that fifteen? Oh, I have to think about that one. Uh, Houston Rockets. No, nah, I can't think of it. It, it despite that, it'd been like Harden. Harden. The only, yeah, it would. If anything, we've been Golden State with like Curry, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, and I want to say Harrison Barnes as well, because those are the only four that I could really. That's the only team I could think of with four all, four All Stars. But it's not to say that Cavs don't have one either. Oh, have that extra one. I can't think of off the top of my head currently, but I bet there was somebody there. Who else was? You say Rockets and who else? Oh, Rockets, Warriors, Hawks, or Cavs? Hawks. That's crazy. I don't even know who the hell Hawks even had on. Who even? Who the hell Hawks even had on that team that year? So I couldn't even answer that one. So let's go with the Warriors. The Warriors final, final answer? answer. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> oh damn! You wouldn't. You, you know it's actually Atlanta Hawks. It was them. <laughs> That's the crazy. I can't think of anybody on that team though. I, I, and for the bonus point, <laughs> is tell me the players they took to the All Star game. Do you, 
The players that he takes it up, bro. That's, oh, that's okay. the bonus point. I mean, I don't know if you'll that's get for, That's for the Atlanta Hawks, yeah? Yeah. Maybe four players. Four players from the Atlanta Hawks season, that 2015 season. Uh, bro, I, don't, I can't even think of anybody from that roster. It's difficult, yeah? <laughs> yeah, don't give up. I'm not going to give up on it. I'm going to think of... I'm gonna to try to think of one player, one player at least. They get, they get point, they get a point two five for every player. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Well, no, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you that because you can do that because it's, it's four players in it. So I'll do that. Four players. One. All right. Yeah. One player. One player. Uh, Al Horford. No, no, he didn't play for him, did he? No, he didn't play for him. I'm thinking of him now. Um. Who was that point guard? Who was that point guard? No, Joe Smith. No. Joe Smith? No, not Joe Smith. Who was that point guard? Bro, I don't even know. Oh, uh, what's his name? Who's that shooter? Who's that shooter? Um, Carl Corver? Are you putting Carl Corver down? I bet that's wrong, though. Nah. Could you please confirm your final answer so I can total the points <laughs> uh, who is this small bro I don't even know I don't actually I don't know I genuinely don't know okay I have to put that at zero but it's funny because you mentioned two of them <laughs> oh Hoford and Kyle Corver yeah they all went to the all-star game <laughs> oh no they did not and then the other, two, the other two Paul Millsap Jeff Teague oh, yeah I wouldn't have guessed those guys that's crazy. Although, yeah, now that you mention it, Jeff Teague, yeah, I do remember him actually being in the All Star game. Yeah. Cool. Okay, fair enough. For that, I have to give you zero because you confirmed he didn't go full for them. Cool. Bro. Damn, I could have got point five. It could have. That's got, hard. I could question yeah, I, number five. What? Yeah. Question number five. LeBron James was drafted in the 03 NBA draft as number one pick. However, who was drafted? A second pick after him is it A, Carmelo Anthony, B, Darko Milicic, C, Chris Bosch, or D, Dwayne Wade? Mm. Um. Who is the other one? Uh, who's the other one? Chris Milicic? No, Darko Milicic. Carmelo, Chris Bosch, or D Wade? Ooh, second round, uh, number two draft pick behind LeBron. Uh, that's tough because I feel like the obvious answers that you want to say might not be it. Would it have been? I feel like Carmelo would have been top ten, but I don't think he would have been top five though. Chris Bosch. Same with Chris Bosch. D Wade. Darko Milicic. Why does that name sound like I want to say yes or no at the same time? Don't know. Uh, let's say no. Actually, yeah. Let's go, Carmelo Anthony. Can I answer? Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> you know what, Carmelo. I think Carmelo was three in that that draft. I think he was third. He was, was he? I think he was third. But second, it was Darko Milicic. He was second. Uh why the, yeah, yeah. Damn. I I didn't I don't know who that guy is, I ain't gonna lie. Before the bonus point, like, what team was he drafted to? Do you know what yeah? For this question, he was drafted from one team to another team. So if you get the other team, I'll give you the bonus point. Darko Milicic. Okay. Yeah. It's either he went from like I feel like he might have been from Dallas Mavericks to like New Orleans 
Hornets or something like that. So, but then you you can give me two teams, and then if you get one of them, okay, I can give you two teams. All right. Uh, oh, oh, can we see that on Super Sonics as well? No, because he has it. All right, I'm going to go with two random teams. Dallas and Phoenix Suns. Wrong and wrong. <laughs> hey, man. I hope you don't put any of this up. <laughs> Bam. It was. He was drafted to Detroit Pistons from Memphis Grizzlies. That was. Okay. Fair. I, I gave you hard questions, I won't lie. You know, yeah, yeah, why I, you give me these hard questions? <laughs> I interviewed Brian Amanda yesterday. He, he got easy questions compared to you. I don't know why I Why you get... No, it is. I don't know. I should have given him these questions. He would get it on your own. He could do both. But this bonus question is difficult. I won't lie to you. If you get this, I'll salute you. <laughs> All right. What is it? Okay. In one minute... Okay. Since LeBron... Entered the league, he's had eight head coaches. In one minute, can you name me every single head coach he's had up until now? Up until now, okay. From You're gonna to have to. Does now. this in, does this all is this all NBA coaches or like yeah. including international M- coach? Uh, NBA. Just oh, all right, all right. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I feel like I should. Well, give I don't you. know. Huh? I think I should give you a two minutes for this. How many coaches has he had? Eight. Three? Eight no, eight. Eight, sorry. Eight. Eight coaches. All right. Tell me when you want the timer to start. <laughs> okay, good. Let's start it now. I'll give you two minutes, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go, go, go. Uh, let's see. Mike Brown. Uh, I can't think of his last name. Lou, though? Tyron Lou? Yeah, Ty Lou. Yeah, Ty Lou. Yeah, Ty Lou. Yeah, uh, head coach for the for the Lakers now. But I can't think of his name, though. Uh. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Tyron Lou, Mike Brown. Um, uh, not Pat Riley, but old boy from Miami. Miami head coach, Miami, Miami, Miami. Uh, oh, I can't think of his name either. Then he went to went back to Yeah, the man left. That's fine. I'm not I'm not going. To... I can see the coach's face in my head, but I can't think of the names. Tyron Lue, Mike Brown. I, can't, I, I actually don't know what coaches he had before Mike Brown. Yeah, that's it. Mike Brown and Tyron Lue. <laughs> Is that what you got to go for? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all I can think of now. You still got twenty seconds. You know, you might, you might guess. Yeah, it. but I can't. <laughs> I can't. I can't think of. I don't know the coach. I don't know his coach that he had when he first got into the league. I, I just literally remember him starting, uh, starting with Mike Brown, and that was it. Okay, I have to give you. You can't get the bonus points of five. That's fine. Um, I'll tell you when he got into the league, it was Paul Silas. At Cleveland. Then he had Brendan Malone. Okay. And then he had Mike Brown. Yeah, Mike Brown. He was in 05. Then he had Spolstra at the Heat. I thought you would get that. Yeah, Spolstra. Yeah, okay. yeah. Spolstra. Okay. Then he went to Cleveland. He had David Black. Remember David Black? Then yeah, he, he got he, he basically got him sent away from yeah. <laughs> Cleveland. So Tyron Luke could come in. Yeah, yeah, Ty yeah. Luke, then Ty Lue. Then Luke Walton. At Lakers, the first year when you got there, and then oh, Frank, yeah. Yeah, Frankie V, he's the man, the coach now. He's the new coach now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Luke Walton. Hmm. 
Forgot about that actually. Forgot Luke Walton was even a coach. Yeah, but just like one year. Man. One year. That was it. Where's he at now? No, nobody knows. Yeah, no one knows. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> don't know what he's doing. That is the end of the Fletcher Knowledge Quiz. And Daniel, you scored a grand total of two points out of 15. But I won't lie, this is the hardest quiz I've ever given to anyone. So out <laughs> of 15. Damn, man. That's tough. That was tough. Yeah. I think, I think this is the lowest ever. But I can't. Oh remember. man, that's no good, man. I gave you very difficult questions. I should have given you, you, you did. MBA. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, you gave that on purpose. Yeah, you start asking about time and stuff. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I remember the time. Wait, what? Oh, no, I, yeah. Damn, I can't remember that. But yeah, yeah. nice, no, man. It's all good. Hey, it's all fun and games, isn't it? And yeah, it's so fun. Doesn't mean that you don't know about the game or know about the yeah, sport. Mean nothing. These, I mean, not many people know these questions. I won't like. You'd have to be a freak to know these answers. Some of them. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you, you do. Yeah, we'll end up with the listeners' questions. And the first question is, what's your opinion on UK basketball and what do you think needs to happen for the UK to get the recognition it deserves? Uh, what is my opinion on UK best? So just getting people to talk about it more, really, um, is one thing and raising like the profile of it in society because, of course, here in England... Your sports is like what football, uh, rugby, and I don't know, like boxing or racing or all, all those other like sports. But then basketball is like, it's like the, the the thought of basketball doesn't truly exist or isn't as mm-hmm. like important as other sports are. When mm-hmm. actually, it actually, it actually is. Like it's actually, it's actually a very competitive sport and stuff. So um, yeah, just getting people to open up like the, the the minds about basketball and just actually understanding the game more. So, um, of course, people, I heard there's like loads of people playing it anyway. But then to play as a professional sport isn't. It's not the profession and the structure of it isn't put in the way like the pathways and stuff aren't there. So that's something to consider. And then um, what else I think needs to happen is that facilities. You know, that's one thing that's lacking with the sport here in England is just the facility, facilities to, to be able to go inside and go play the sport somewhere. Like, you know, I'm, I know America's, like, completely different, but in America, like, there's not one street you can go down and you don't see a facility somewhere where you can play basketball or you can play mm-hmm. an indoor sport. Like, there's facilities, there's universities, there's everything that you could think of. And as long as you know people, and that's the only thing, that's what matters. Here in England, it's like facilities are, like, treasure you know it's like everybody's trying to profit off of people playing or using the facility to play a recreational sport which i mean it's kind of tough because it it, it's it's like uh yeah it's kind of tough because it's like you want to say that okay i could get it from a business point of view but then also like why should someone have to pay to play a sport recreationally inside where in America and stuff like that like you could walk in and you could just literally just you don't have to pay anything like the facility is free it's there to use like you could go and play basketball sort of thing so I mean I guess there's that business aspect put in it but still it's just something that is kind of I, I found it very unusual when I first got here like if I wanted to go train indoors somewhere I have to pay it's my prof- I'm a professional athlete. Why do I have to pay to play a sp- to pay my profession? Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? so yeah, yeah, it is mad. It's mad. I still didn't understand it. Okay, that's cool. That's interesting. I, I agree with you as well. Like, even growing up, there wasn't mm-hmm. much facilities to play basketball. It was only just football and mm. athletics, if anything. But yeah, if anything. That's it. What is your ultimate starting five, NBA? Ultimate starting five. Uh, what now? Now or just like, like over history of basketball? All time, all time, yeah, all time. All time. Mm, Magic Johnson, PG. Uh, MJ, shooting guard. KD. Oh, that's tough. KD or LeBron? Both. 
Nah, nah, I can't put both of them there. KD, I love LeBron. And I, I, oh, it's tough, it's tough. Because if I would have, yeah, let's go. Nah, let's go LeBron. Let's go LeBron. I'll go LeBron. Just because I'm a LeBron fan. I'll go LeBron over KD at the at the three. But uh, honestly, honestly, I wouldn't mind putting KD at the three as well. Like, mm. it'll be, they're both great players at the position. Um, So, uh, K, uh, Le- LeBron at the three, uh, AD at the four. AD, all time. All time? AD is in your all time team. I mean, that's your opinion, obviously. I was just surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's other players I could think of. I mean, you got like KG, you got Timmy D, you got Dirk. Yeah, I guess. No, wait, there's actually something to think about. No, that is something to think about. You got Dirk, you got, I mean, you got a large, a large one's footwork was impeccable, still tough. Footwork was impeccable. Um, who else you got? Who else we got? No, I wouldn't put Paul Mills. Of course not Paul Mills. No. You know what? Yeah. That's kind of tough. AD, AD, you know, AD could actually go up there. Yeah. Nah. You know, let's let's go. Let's go. Um, you know what? Yeah. Oh, that's tough. That's tough, too. I want to say KG, actually. KG was a beast. KG was low-key a beast. Yeah, he was a beast. He fought, and he could shoot the ball as well. And he didn't... Yeah, KG. Let's go, KG. KG. And then at the five... Oh, man. Tough, because you cannot stop him. Diesel. Shaq Diesel. <laughs> How about Kareem? Not Kareem? <sighs> Look, I love Kareem. But... It's like... If you used to match up Kareem and Shaq on a one-on-one, I mean, Shaq would probably eat him alive in the, in, by the basket. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's tough. That's tough. Because then if you, yeah, it's because you think about like, yeah, he, I mean, you think about like the type of dynamic that you have with like with the, the, the line, lineup that I just presented. I mean, everybody can stretch the floor out well. Actually, you know what? Yeah, 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 yeah. I like it. I like I like the lineup I got. Cool. Yes, that's it. So you MJ, uh, MJ, no, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, LeBron, uh, who else I say? Uh, KG and Shaq. Cool, solid team. Okay, would you rather take okay, say playoff finals, Bristol? One second left on the clock. Are mm. you taking the shot or are you kicking out to the open man? How much time is on the clock? What? This is last possession. Last possession. <laughs> last possession. Am I open? Huh? <laughs> Am I you, open? You have the ball. You're guarded. You're, you're on fire. You've hit 45, 15 and 5. You've done a LeBron against Boston. You're on, you're on fire. <laughs> So they got three guys on you. You're driving to the rim. There's a guy wide open. <laughs> point shooter. Are you kicking out to him or are you taking it? Is the game tied? <laughs> no, this guy. The game, no, you're, you're, you're behind. You're behind. Oh, we're behind. By how much? Two. Behind by two. Yeah, I'm taking it. Why? Because either one of three things is going to happen. I'm going to make the basket. I might make the basket and get an end one, or I might get fouled and go to the free throw line. What? Or you might just miss. <laughs> or I could just miss. But I, I'm more than sure, yes, it's one of the... Well, if, 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 if the person I'm kicking it to has been knocking down shots and has been making a contribution, yeah, of course. No doubt about that. If you have, like, we've both been making cool, shots. We'll be, oh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm selfish like that. I'll kick it to you. And I trust that you make the shot. Is it? So you would kick it out? You wouldn't take it on yourself? <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it depends on it depends on the situation, but probably not. Okay. I probably would I probably would genuinely kick it out. Actually, I would probably just genuinely kick it, kick it out, especially if I know like, oh, like, I have these many people around me, so somebody's wide open. Okay. Somebody. So yeah, yeah. 
Fair enough. So you're, you're putting the whole destiny in someone else's hands. Okay. Yeah, um, why not? Because I, I thought you were the captain. I thought you were the captain. I thought you were going to take it by the scuff of the neck and lead by example. <laughs> but all right. Fair hey, enough. Hey, hey, sometimes the captain doesn't always need to do that, though. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Hey, look at, LeBron, look at LeBron and Kyrie. I mean, Kyrie's, remember when they played a. Uh, when they played a uh, Golden State and Kyrie knocked down a three point shot to yeah. take the lead, mm-hmm. but, that but then LeBron good. came. That was different. Still, yeah. same thing. What last shot? I'm thinking of Game Five, Finals last year, where LeBron he was on form, he was hot, he was driving to the basket, kicked it back to Danny Green, he missed the shot, they lost the game, went to Game Six, they won it eventually. But that sort of situation. Oh, okay. Scenario. Okay. Yeah, that sort of situation. Yeah. But then you, you think the person that you're kicking it to, I mean, he's a great shooter. Yeah. He's a great shooter. Danny Green's a good shooter. Like, he can't really get mad. But in those finals, he was, boy, he was, he was <laughs> doing bad. But I, I mean, it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's difficult. If you kick it out and they miss, it's your fault. Kick it out and they score, it's a great play. It's chalk and cheese. Yeah. And That's play. it. The ball just has to go through the net either way. Yeah. Okay. Would you rather be a great player, but a trashed legacy? Or a good player, but no one remembers you. Mm. When you say a great player and a trash legacy, what is a trash legacy? I always use this example. <laughs> I guess I say your legacy is equivalent to R. Kelly. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> but R. Kelly, that's that. He doesn't even have a good reputation. That's the way, but he was a great artist. That's the thing. <laughs> great artist, terrible reputation. Yeah, would you have that or just no one remembers you at all? You're just on un... everyone forgot. No, I, I I'd rather people remember me. I'd rather people not remember me than to have a trash legacy. Because that's not the kind of legacy I want to leave behind. You yeah, know what I mean? That's true. Yeah, yeah. I have kids, I have kids in that, they like, oh yeah, my dad was just like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. I hear that. Um, do you have any regrets in your life? Like, if you could change a part of your journey, what would you change? Uh, see, I, these things, nah, I wouldn't. Because if, if I if I changed any part of my journey, I wouldn't be here now. Uh, but if, okay, let's just, let's just think about it. If I was to change a part of my journey, it would probably be... Uh, it will probably be my choice as to what kind of basketball program I want to play for when I left from high school to uni. Okay. Yeah, because then, and what level I truly wanted, to, like, what was if there was something I wanted to figure out. It would have been what was what would have been more important, like playing experience and playing time, or just saying you got to a high level but never played. That's one mm. of those things. Okay, interesting. Who's the hardest player you've ever played against? Hardest player I've ever played against? Yeah. Mm, just in general? Uh, just in general. Think about any players from college or university. I just play played against. I just play ever played against. Huh. I want to say. Um, that's actually a really good question. I'm trying to figure out who. who can I, I want, I'm trying to figure out some people from uni that I that I've came across, and oh. What's his name? Um, he played for Oklahoma, and he played with Buddy Buddy Hield, uh, Ryan something. He was like a big man, but he was like he was strong and physical. Like he was like like just like damn, I need to get in the gym some more. You know what I mean, sort of guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was he was he was smart. Um, he was actually very, and he could like stretch the floor as well. So he he's he's like he didn't have nothing to nothing to lose sort of thing. Um, 
Yeah, that wasn't that was like uni days. No, another player would have been like maybe uh what's his name? Ali Frazier from well he plays less now, but when he was at Glasgow, he's a bit more like he had, he has this kind of move that he uses where you it's hard to like kind of get around him and if you try to get around him then it's the following you sort of thing. Yeah. So he's like that sort of like mind game tactical bit. Um he he was actually really good at. So yeah, I'll say those two players. I can't think of that name. His his name is Ryan something like Ryan Spencer or something like that. Okay. So yeah. Which players did do you did you look up to when you were younger? Or have what you players up? I look up to? Yeah. What players did I look up to when I was younger? Even now as LeBron well. Yeah, LeBron James is definitely one. Um LeBron's definitely one. Kobe was also another one as well. Kobe. Uh what's his name? The, like you're just saying like on the court wise, like playing wise, or just in general, like looking up to inspiring, like actually want to be like them and stuff like that. Yeah, in general, actually, yeah, in general, actually, yeah. Mm. Beyond sport, in general? sport beyond sport, yeah. Good, good question. Um, yeah, definitely LeBron. Definitely LeBron in terms of like the way he carries himself and there's like maturity and I guess sense of like sense of like genuinity. Um those like certain aspects that he he like always portrays, always portrayed and still portrays now to this day. Like mm. he just seems down to earth and like very like he has this element of this this deep sense of like inner grounding and stability in how he approaches life and also like how he is with his boys and his kids and his family and stuff like that. Like you, you can tell like he's a he's a very family oriented oriented guy. So mm. um yeah that's that's somebody who like still like, I aspire I aspire once maybe still aspire now to, to kind of like not saying be like but just some of the ways of being, like, what's helped him to get, what, what certain things that he has or how he carries himself that has got him to ways at now sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. LeBron James. And on LeBron, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? They're two different players, man. But it depends, like, are you saying on the court, on the court just specifically? Yeah. Who the GOAT? Yeah, who the, who's the GOAT? Yeah, the greatest of all time. This is where it gets interesting. We're talking about just someone who's going to grind it out, grit it out, like dog mindset, like hungry, talking about someone who doesn't care what you think, like talking about aspects of leadership, then that's definitely like MJ. You know, that's definitely like that, that, that mentality, the mental side of the game, that's MJ got that all day. Uh, we're talking about someone who's just a freak of nature, who's basically physically gifted, but also has the the, the basketball IQ, uh, then that's LeBron. You know, that's, yeah. it's it's kind of like one of those, it's, it's a hard kind of debate to have because they both have different, they have different aspects of the personalities that make them the players that they are. You know, it's, it, if it, if if we're gonna say if we're gonna compare anybody, it should be like Kobe or MJ. You know, that's the closest two that we can really com- be compared to. Yeah, but we and ain't we comparing know. that. You're going <laughs> LeBron, who is he, who you going for? If I'm if I'm taking if I'm trusting someone to take the last shot, it's definitely MJ. Yeah, that's that case scenario. That's that's what MJ would do. Though. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> He'll go one or three and tell you, I'm going to get this bucket. Go one or three and still get the bucket. He's that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah, it just depends, man. But, yeah, I'll definitely pick MJ. Okay, MJ. Fair enough. A couple more questions. Who is the most uh, inspirational person in your life? Well, like, oh, that was, oh, this is. Who's the most inspirational coach in your life? And what advice have they given to you? Most inspirational coach. Or people. I use that. People. Yeah. Uh that's a good question. Good question. Uh I'll say two pe- two key people who I don't talk to now, but I still have them in my mind. Uh my head coach from Iowa State, Fred Hoiberg. Big up. Uh yeah. 
uh, just he's he was just calm, like he's just very relaxed and very poised with how he would talk and how he would be. He was like, like, dude, like Brian, like he, like you, you just never knew where the hell he was at, sort of thing. But every time you come to practice, like he would you know, talk to us and see how we do and stuff like that uh, from time to time and all that stuff. Um, his biggest thing was just, I don't know, I guess he, I guess he was a solid, he was, he was a solid sort of like player coach. Like he understood that we're players, but we're also, I guess, people behind, like, you know, people who, people, like we're also humans behind the aspect of our game or, you know, being an athlete and stuff. Um, so yeah, he was good like that. And then also, my old uh, instructor, my old professor from uni, um, a psychologist. Oh, he's he's like a psychology teacher. Um, so he's I always talk to him from time to time. Funny enough, mentioning talking about it, I haven't talked to him in a while. But yeah, he's like he's like my sort of father figure kind of guy, like someone who I can talk to and. Just kind of put it all out on the table. He is to me, and you know, gives me the sort of advice that I need to kind of like make it through. Um, yeah, I say that those are like my two key sources of inspiration. Well, that's good. Yeah, Just, yeah. Um, and two more. Um, what advice would you give to like young ballers growing up or anyone who's facing adversity throughout their lives? Uh, I could give answers to both of those. <laughs> Which one yeah. you'll be good? To? Which one you'll be give answers to? Both. Yeah. Okay. So my advice for young ballers: uh, start learning the game. Like learn the game. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. We can have all these moves in the book. You know, and stuff like that. But ultimately, what sets you apart is your understanding of the game and like knowing where to be and how to play the pick and roll, how to look for certain. More, look at certain moments of the game and you know like just just those like nitty gritty like attention to detail things that's going to help you to stand out like a coach will be more likely to pick a player who understands the game who knows mm. the game who knows what how to like look uh, for certain things like player who knows how to pass and cut or you know go back door go sit the down screens just certain stuff like that than the player who will be trying to showboat and showcase the whole bag, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> as look as good as it looks, it's not going to fit into everybody's system, you know. So um, that sort of aspect uh, is 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 important, and just learning how to keep it simple as well. Um, in terms of those who are going through that ad- ad- adversity in life, listen, I get it. It sucks. It's sometimes adversity sucks. But ultimately, it's your view of it that's going to help you to either get over it or that's going to help you, that's going to make you keep on feeling the way you're feeling now. And if you have these sort of like views where, oh, man, life is tough, I'm not going to get over it, you know, of course, like you're never, you're never going to get over it being that way, you know, mm-hmm. not complaining isn't going to get you anywhere. You know, it's always finding that motivation that when adversity comes, it's like, okay, the question is, what are you going to do about it? You know, and then that that puts you in a space of finding solutions as to how to deal with things. So, you know, that's that's the best advice that I can give is, you know, not complaining and asking yourself the question, what are you going to do about it? That's it. Nice. And finally, what's next for Daniel Adozi? What's the future plans and your ambitions? Still trying to figure it out, man. (laughs) 28 years old, still trying to figure it out. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think, uh, that's some, that's food for thought over like the next few months, you know, that's kind of, it's kind of like, yeah, right now I'm focusing the season, but it's no telling where I'm, no telling where I'll be in like, what's this, January? Eight, nine months from now? Mm. I could be still here in England, maybe not playing basketball, but doing something different. I could be, I don't know, somewhere in Europe playing basketball. I could be in America. Like, there's nothing's promised. So it's like kind of reserving. I would like to think that, you know, next year I'll go play somewhere else in Europe, you know, but who's to say that life might say, you know what? Yeah, yeah that sounds good, but 
I got a better door for you to walk through that's going to fill you with many different blessings. You know, this, mm-hmm. that sort of thing, like nothing's never guaranteed. You just got to always kind of, kind of keep your, 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 your mind open or keep an open mind and be open to different opportunities. Okay, cool. I um, we'll hope all the best for the future. But Daniel, it's been a power packed, inspirational episode. I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Like I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best for the season. Keep on balling. Keep on blocking them shots, getting them rebounds, getting them tri- noobs. <laughs> and yeah, but I just wish you the best. Man. We'll see you for the next episode. Now, of course, man. Of course, man. Nah, thank you for having me on your show, man. I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, that quiz was the hardest thing I've had to think of all day. Oh, I, that, the hardest stretch of questions I've ever heard. So I'm like, yeah, I can't remember. But yeah, no, nah, it was fun though, man. It's fun. And I hope you take away some good stuff. And thanks for allowing me to share my story on your platform and stuff. That's cool.